Okay, so last time we're looking at the ring of gajis, which addresses the question of why be good. We saw the challenge put forth by Glaucon in regards to a perfectly unjust person against the just person. And essentially, the, you know, to give the way Socrates responds, his argument is essentially that the unjust person, their injustice will consume them and ruin their life, make them go mad. In the case of the just person, his claim is, even under those terrible circumstances, the just person will still be better off. Now, of course, in uh, religion, there's kind of an interesting parallel to the story. There's the classic um, you know, tale of Job. And the idea is you get Job doing pretty well. And then you know, Satan goes to God and says, hey, God, guess, let's make a bet. And the bet is, of course, to see if he can get, you know, if, if uh, Job will renounce his faith which is a similar sort of challenge. In the case of the Ring of Gajis, the challenge is, why be good? If, you know, if everything is going horribly, why stick to goodness, even when there seems to be no external reward? And then this, the later story of Job, of course, a similar challenge. Why stick to one's faith when everything seems to be going badly? And so a similar kind of problem there. And it's a question, you know, fortunately, we generally don't face those extremes of you know, perfect injustice or perfect justice, but it's a question that we all have to answer. And do we choose to be good or choose to be bad? Now, suppose we do choose to be good, or we want other people to be at least not bad. Well, that takes us to the question of moral education. Now, moral education involves all sorts of different types of stuff. Now, it can include things, you know, obvious things like passing on values. Primarily, that's what it involves doing. It involves um, inculcating people, you know, in these values, etc. And there's various um, ways to approach it. One could involve sort of what we're doing here, which is learning about ethics and morality in an academic concept. What are these theories? What are the methods? The basic idea is passing on values. Now, as you might imagine, with pretty much every aspect of moral education, there is controversy. So if you, when you look at the various questions, if you ask different people, or different people, or the same people on different days, you'll get different responses. Now, from a purely practical standpoint, there are some very good practical reasons to engage in moral education. Why so? Well, one practical reason is this. In order for a society, a civilization, a culture to continue, the values have to be passed on. Because one kind of reasonable way to define the death of a culture is the end of the values. They're not passed along. And we can imagine, you know, like genetically people surviving, but the culture itself being extinguished because all everything else, language, rituals, etc., are you know, lost or not passed on. Secondly, there's also the practical thing of, as a practical matter, we have to have allowed and not allowed behavior, which involves passing on you know, values. Now, turning now to the moral stuff, there are various sets of questions that are essential to consider when considering moral education. A first foundational question is this. What is human nature? Is there such a thing? And throughout the course of you know, thinking about this, various answers have been given. Now, here are some of the standard <coughs> stock answers. One approach is, of course, to take the view that people are basically good in some degree. And, of course, the opposing viewpoint is that people are basically bad in some degree. And, of course, people diff differ among even those who believe people are basically good or bad, they differ in how much goodness or badness they think are built into people. Now, if people are basically good, you know, inclined towards good, then moral education is much easier. To use the obvious crap analogy, if people are basically good at saying math, then teaching people math is easier than people are. Now, if people are basically bad, 
moral education in terms of making them good becomes all the much you know, harder because you have to overcome that badness. Again, going with the crap analogy, if people are basically bad at saying math or critical thinking, then trying to teach people that sort of thing would be all the much harder. And different methods would have to be used. Going back to the you know, moral stuff, if people are basically good, then moral education might just involve keeping them from being corrupted. And if people are basically evil, then moral education, of course, would be pretty tough. Now, what are some examples of philosophers who believe this? Well, a good example is our good dead friend Confucius. He thought people were basically good. Not like pure moral saints, but basically good. In terms of people being basically bad, well, Thomas Hobbes' view of people seemed to cast people as basically bad, or at least qualities we tend to think of as bad, selfish, violent, etc. Now, of course, there's also the view that people in general are not born good or bad. They may have certain inclinations, certain you know, behavioral traits, but that people are basically morally neutral, neither born good nor bad, and they could go either way. And of course, there's also another possible view that it all depends on the individual. Some people are born bad, some people are born good, and it can vary from person to person. In which case, if you happen to have someone who's born good, then making them good is easier. If you happen to have someone who's born inclined to badness, educating them morally would be harder. Now, what are reasons to think any of these are correct? Well, in the case of people being born good, what you do is you, you know, to prove it sort of, I guess, empirically or scientifically, would be to see how people behave before they're socialized. And some people have, have made the case that children are inclined towards compassion and views of justice before education screws them up. In terms of badness, people have made similar claims that children are selfish and poorly behaved before we socialize them to teach them that, you know, sharing is caring. That people are a mix is supported by various claims that you can have people who are born into terrible circumstances and have, you know, bad relatives, but turn out decently, despite all that potential badness. And then, of course, supporting the people, some people are born bad, are cases where people have come from good, I mean, you know, morally decent families, decent circumstances, but turn out to be bad. And then, of course, for neutral, that's kind of an easy approach, that people are neither good nor bad, and the claim is often made that people turn out to be whatever we make them into. We can mold them into monsters or saints, depending on how much you want to put into it. So kind of our first question to address is, is there human nature? If so, what is it? And the folks who look at Aristotle and Rousseau have definite opinions. Uh, Aristotle, to give a little spoiler alert, takes people to be basically neutral, inclined to virtue, but we can be you know, educated either way. Rousseau takes people to be basically good. And different you know, moral theorists, the you know, ones we're not looking at, would have different answers as well. Question two is, is moral education possible? It's always good to ask before you try to do something, can this be done? Because if the answer is, nope, can't be done, you know, for real, then trying it probably wouldn't be a great idea. Unless maybe there's some value in doing, attempting the impossible. Now, on one hand, there's an easy answer. Moral education is clearly possible because we've been doing it. We've been passing on values to people, generation after generation. So the answer to that seems to be yes. Now, just because something's possible doesn't mean that it's desirable. For example, um, William Shatner uh, has actually released, you know, him, you know, recordings of himself singing, um, which so it's you know possible to find that, but a question would be, is that desirable? And the answer may be yes, maybe no. 
Now, in regards to desirable, various potential answers, of course. The main ones being yeah, and the other one being no. In terms of the yes side, one response about why it's desirable could be kind of practical. Especially, you know, for people who are adults, we want the kids to be like not awful. You know, it's kind of like if the kids are going to be picking, you know, where you retire, you'd want them to be non horrible. So you might have good reasons as to why they should be good. Now, in terms of why it might not be desirable, arguments that some people have advanced is that it could impose on people. It could take the kids and impose on their autonomy, that it'd be inflicting values on them. Now, of course, going along with the um, desirable part, there's also the question about which particular values might be desirable. So if you know, kids are being taught, say, awful morals, we might say that would be undesirable, turn them into monsters. So the third, three initial questions are, what is the nature of humanity, which affects how we engage in education? Is it possible? Answer seems yes. And the third question is, is it actually desirable? And different answers have been, been given. Again, a practical one is, as a practical matter, we probably want the kids not to be awful, so we probably want to teach them. But then there is a concern that imposing values on them might interfere with their autonomy and their development. It's kind of similar to the sort of general parenting concern about what sort of values should be imposed on the children. So, for example, take a classic one outside of new ethics, take religion. Should parents, you know, teach their kids their religion? Or should they let them, you know, give, offer it as an opportunity? Or should they compel them to adopt that religion? Or their sports teams. Suppose the parents are fans of the Cubs. Should they impose Cub fanship on their children? I think we could probably agree that would be, that would be wrong. In the case of the Cubs, Red Sox, probably okay. Before moving on to the next exciting slide, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff or questions, comments, or anything? Okay, next exciting slide, as we're told by slide prophecy. Now, once we've settled those initial questions, we can move on to the questions of who, why, what, and others. The first question here is, what is the objective? What's the purpose? And this is something that can be raised by any form of education. What are we trying to do here? You know, any uh, course, for example, has to address that question. What is the purpose? Now, in some cases, the purpose of education is you know, pretty clear. For example, if you're taking a class in driver's ed, the purpose is to learn how to drive. If you're taking a class in, you know, to get your concealed weapon permit, the purpose is very straightforward, to learn the basic gun safety, to take the class, so you can qualify legally for the permit. If you're taking a class on you know, drawing, the purpose is pretty clear, to learn how to draw. But in the case of moral education, the purpose can vary quite a bit. Is the goal to impart, say, theoretical understanding of ethics? And that's kind of what we're doing in this course. I'm not trying to make you good or make you bad, you're essentially learning you know, about you know, methods of moral reasoning, the various theories, etc. So it's, the purpose is not to make you better people, except in the sense of you know, learning stuff. Or perhaps the purpose should be to make people better people. Aristotle, for example, regards the purpose of moral education not just to teach people, like, here's some stuff about ethics and moral theory, but to make people good. So just like if you're trying to teach anything, you need to know what is your purpose, what is your goal. And different people, of course, give very different answers. And once we decide what we're trying to do, the next question is, who should be the moral educators? Now, another way to look at that is, when things go wrong, who should get the blame? So, for example, if we have... Um, as we've had, you know, occur all too often, we have like a school shooting or you know mass shooting, and the question is, you know, who's responsible for that? Who failed? Now we do, you know, often go to, into debates about you know gun control, mental illness, etc. 
But there's also you know, the moral question. Who was responsible for that person being <laughs> such that you walk into a school and just start killing people? How did that, you know, who, who failed? Was it the person themselves? Was it the teachers, et cetera? Now, when it comes to the question of who the moral educators are or should be, we generally give the following kinds of answers, especially when we're talking about like, the kids. And likely candidates include what? Who teaches the kids? Parents. Yeah, parents is one main one. And we often you know, see them as a primary moral educator, teaching their kids you know, the right from wrong, et cetera. But then around age five, who spends a lot of time with the kids? Yeah, uh, you know, teacher teachers. You know, the folks K through 12. And as you might imagine, most people think, you know, it's a parents they have a lot of responsibility because they're parents. But there are cases where people say, well, it's not, you know, there's certain things that aren't the parents' job. And so it's a good, you know, very practical question, and not just a theoretical moral one, but what responsibilities do parents have? What should they be responsible for? And the same with the teachers. It is a teacher's job just to teach kids, you know, the math, the science, the reading, the arithmetic, or do they have a role in teaching morality, teaching ethics? And if so, as we'll see, what kind of stuff? Now, in addition to the parents and the teachers, who else is supposed to lay out the moral lessons? Well, who serves as moral guides for a civilization? Yeah, the, the police, the state, the authorities. And they're sometimes seen as in the role of, you know, teaching or imposing morality. And this also is quite controversial. You know, what sort of, should the state be in the business of imposing, you know, ethics? And this leads to, you know, especially many of the things that is be, are being taught are quite controversial. In addition, of course, to the state, we also have other sources of ethics, like, um, you know, religion. We have the temple, synagogues, and mosques that, you know, teach values to people. And, and of course, we have, you know, role models. Which does lead to some other interesting questions. For example, when, um, if anybody's interested in like the sports stuff, one question, if you're, and also if you're looking for a paper and you like the sports stuff, one interesting, potential interesting question is, do professional athletes, football players, golfers, you know, um, curling athletes, do they have a moral obligation to serve as moral educators, as role models? There's, of course, one basketball player who famously said, I'm not a role, not a role model. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'll accept even recorded applause. That's how sad I am. <laughs> I should actually put it on my phone and just build up my self esteem by playing it. Yes, yes, so great. <laughs> um, so there is that question about you know, do athletes, or we could also include other celebrities. We can include you know, actors, etc., as having an obligation to serve as role models. Now, one, and again, if you're looking to look at a paper topic, then you like the sports stuff, this could be a you know, potentially interesting you know, issue. And the issue would be, you could take like, you know, professional athletes, or if you want to focus it even narrower, you could take like, our professional athletes, say in the NFL or the NBA, or you know, Major League Baseball, are they obligated to serve as role models? Now, one argument against this could be something like this. You can look at it in terms of what the job actually you know, entails. What does the job involve? So, you could, if you take like basketball, what are basketball players paid to do? Well, basically they're paid to do two things. Thing one is put the ball in the, the hoop. <laughs> Thing two is keep the other team from putting the ball in the hoop. And that's what it comes down to. Ball and hoop, keep ball from hoop. And that's basically basketball 
at the very ba base level. Same with like football. Football players are paid to do two things. Thing one is get the ball into the end zone or through the upright. So I guess it's four things. Then, you know, that's thing two. You know, the other thing is keep the other team from doing that. Similar like with hockey or, you know, or soccer. The goal is always to keep the other team from doing what you're trying to do. And so you could say there's nothing in the job description of, you know, basketball player or football player that cast them as a moral educator. It, you know, to use, you could also use an analogy. If someone is hired to be a physicist or janitor or an engineer, those jobs don't involve more education. Your, your job is, if you're a janitor, the job is to clean stuff. If you're a physicist, it's to do stuff in physics. And so you could say that their job description is such, they're there to put the ball through the hoop or keep the ball from getting put through the hoop. Now, an argument against that could be this. <clears throat> to quote a great philosopher, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. responsibility. So you could argue that even though the job description of you know, basketball players and celebrities doesn't include being more a role, more, more role model, the fact is they have all that influence. That creates a responsibility that they are influential on people. And so their actions have more consequences than other, pe other people. Not always, but in general. So they have an obligation to serve as proper role models. And you can do an appeal to consequences. Because if people are imitating bad behavior, and people think, for example, that an acceptable way to deal with you know, a dispute with one's you know, fiance is to punch her in the face until she's unconscious, and then that would be bad. Another argument that can be used is this. Although you know professional athletes and celebrities make a lot of money doing their you know basketball thing, getting paid for it, they also get a fair amount of money doing commercials, selling you know selling products, etc. And one that goes along with that is they they monetize their influence. And if they have that influence on in other people and they're making a profit from it that gives them an obligation to serve as good role models. Because if they're profiting from, their, if they're engaging in influence and profiting from it, that creates on their part an obligation to serve as a good influence. And you can use, again, an appeal to consequences. So they could argue that <laughs> professional athletes should be more obligated to, maybe not be moral, morally saints, but they should operate you know, as good role models. And again, the counter is they are paid to put you know, the ball through the hoop, and that is the end of their responsibilities. In regards to the influence thing, you'd say, well, they're getting paid to sell batteries or Gatorade or cars, and that does not create any moral obligation. They're just trying to sell stuff. And so, potentially interesting or boring paper talk. Other... Um, Oh, another thing, of course, would be the uh, media. Does the media sometimes get blamed when bad stuff happens? I mean, the media in general. Does it include, you know, like news, um, movies, you know, video games, etc.? Does that, when something bad happens, they get some blame? Yeah, I mean, one thing that people brought up is that. By making you know people famous for doing awful things, that encourages you know it sends a lesson, a moral education. You want to be if you if a person thinks they're a nobody, one way to become a somebody and get on national international news is do something horrible. And that sends that teaches a lesson. You want to be famous, do something really really bad. And then of course people blame. Um, you know, video games and movies, when they had the, the shooting at Columbine back in 1999, they blamed The Matrix, Basketball Diaries, and Doom, saying that those taught the kids to solve problems with violence. And video games, in general, get that, you know, critique. The idea being that they teach, you know, games like Grand Theft Auto teach the kids to, you know, solve problems with violence, to run over hookers with cars, <laughs> That type of stuff. That's what the game's all about. 
killing people, stealing cars, and running over hookers, or cash pinatas, as some people like to call them. They are full of cash. It's true. If you're short on cash in Grand Theft Auto, hookers are your ATMs, or pinatas, <laughs> your one-stop shop. And of course, you know, violent movies, similar sort of accusation. And so there is that fair question. Should, you know, the media, should they, and this has been a, a debate, and it's been a debate, you know, for quite some time. It was first suggested, in, actually in science fiction, that when someone does something awful, what the media should do is either not mention the person's name or refer to them as like a doofus or a jackass or something. So say, you know, some jackass doofus shot up some people. We should never, well, should never speak their name again. They should be known forever as doofus, you know, 465. And people have argued that would deter, you know, that would deter people because they'd never be, they would never be famous. In the case of, you know, movies and video games, you know, these are also potentially interesting paper topics. Should movies or video games be required to be less violent? Or, you know, have less, like a Grand Theft Auto, have less, you know, sexuality, violence, and criminal activities? And does this actually cause kids, you know, people to behave badly, teach them bad things? And so the question of who is a moral educator, who's accountable, and what sort of things should people be allowed to do or not do in their role, either voluntarily or involuntarily, as educators, all important questions. Now, once we answer those questions, once you know what we're trying to do and who should do it, the next question is, of course, do we have like one morality or do you present kids with like a variety of options? In many ways, it's kind of like the, uh, to draw an analogy with the religion thing, it's kind of the, um, a similar kind of question. Should kids be, you know, when they're taught by their parents, should their kids say, this is what we believe, this is the only option? Uh, for example, um, as always, I saw something on Facebook. I'm not sure if this is, you know, because it's on Facebook, so I'm not sure if it's true or not, but there was apparently a mother who was outraged that her child was required to um, learn about Islam, the five pillars. They, they weren't converting them to Islam. They just, one of their assignments was they had to learn the five pillars of Islam and, like, watch a video about it. And the mother was outraged by this. And so one view is, is that only, say, one religion should be taught to the kids, and they should not be exposed to anything else. And by analogy, you could say that, well, we should teach the kids just one morality. Now, one argument for this is a practical one. I'll use a crappy analogy. Suppose we're teaching, like, math to the kids. Should we teach them, like, different maths? Should the, should the person say, well, you know, most people think 2 plus 2 is 4, but perhaps there are alternatives where some may think that 2 plus 2 may be like 5. And if you're teaching like driver's ed, you know, and teaching, you know, well, here we drive on the right-hand side of the road, but, you know, maybe the left hand is good too, so, you know, go with how you feel about that. Now, what would be a practical problem with teaching all kinds of, like, different views on stuff like math or driving? Well, oh, I mean, it could be an advantage. What would be a bad thing about having all kinds of different options? A lot of you on the same accord. Yeah, people are doing different stuff, and it can get confusing. You know, people go, "Which one is, <laughs> which one is right? Do I run on the left hand side or right hand side?" So, one argument for having one morality is, of course, like you know, it's a clarity of message, one voice speaking one thing, and of course. If we think we have the one true view, that's one we want to, just like with religion, that's one we want to, to teach. So there are some good reasons to have just one set of values. Now when it comes to civil moralities, well, one argument for this might be, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. For example, if we're trying, to, if our goal is to teach people about ethics, in morality, to use the analogy of religion, if we're teaching a class on religion in an academic context, we wouldn't just want to teach like one, just say, okay, here's one religion. We want to teach, you know, them all. Not in the sense of like, here, accept this faith, but the sense of this is Buddhism, this is Hinduism, this is Zoroastrianism, this is Islam, this is Christianity, this is Buddhism, this is Zen Buddhism, etc. 
Because in order to know about religion, you have to know about the <laughs> different varieties. And by analogy, you could say if you're going to learn about morality, you have got to learn the different theories. Another argument people give is that people should have choices. You know, you don't want to impose upon you know, people a one morality view, but give them options to pick from. Now, of course, the problem is that this can create confusion, and if we believe in objective morality, that means that most of all those except for one, or maybe all of them, will be wrong. Now, once we settle all these problems, questions and get the purpose of the educators, whether one or many, the next problem is the problem of content. What is it that we're going to teach? Like we can go back to the previous section with the different moral theories. Do we teach like utilitarianism as the correct view? Do we teach deontology? Do we teach virtue theory? More practically, there is the particulars. I mean, I'll give um, um, two examples, torn from today's headlines. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm trying to write my paper on this. So our paper is based on like just facts, like how you're saying the different one. There's one more and several more. So we just talk about our opinion. Oh, for your paper? Yeah. Oh, what you do in your your paper? Is you would uh, well. What's your what's your topic issue? My topic is resting towns. But oh. I'm talking about more. Oh yeah. So what what you'd uh, oh you don't have to yeah because you don't have to. It's a good question. You don't have to decide um, which morality is correct. Because, but what you do in the what you do in the case is probably the best way to approach that is so, you know select one of the methods we use. So you don't have to address the question, is deontology correct or is you know, um, consequentialism correct? What you do is essentially try to argue for that position. So you may, for example, use like an appeal to consequences and say, you know, you might say, I will argue for, uh, my position is that people should not let their talents rust and I will argue for this morally by using appeal to consequences. The way I'll do this is by laying out, here are the you know, potential pluses of letting your talents rust. Here is the potential minuses. Morality should be assessed based on, you know, the consequences, as, you know, per John Stuart Mill, he argued, as he argued utilitarianism. I've shown that there's more pluses and minuses in terms of developing your talents, so it would be right to develop your talents. Okay. Or another thing you might do is um, use some other method. You might do like a like an appeal to rights. You might say that people have a right to not develop their talents somehow. Yes, you don't have to, you don't have to solve the question of what is the correct morality. Yeah, you don't have to solve that question. What, what you, the most straightforward way to do it is look at the, the methods you went through and you know, pick one or, or two of those, or maybe three, and use those to build your, your argument. Yes, you don't have to address the question like, here I will prove that, you know, Utilitarianism is correct because that would be like a dissertation or book project. Yeah, so you can just you can pull one of the methods without worrying whether there are one or several moralities. You just have to argue for your your position. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, when it comes to content, um, one example you know torn from today's headlines, which has many sub issues, is the matter of um, sex ed, which is you know there's also there's just the sort of physiological facts. This is how the plumbing works. But of course it's also fraught with moral concerns as well. For example, some uh, people advocate absence only education. You go in and this is all you need to know about sex. Just say no. Other people, you know, argue for more developed moral education. Or more, sorry, sexual um, ed, sex ed. Other people put forth the view that things like alternative, you know, views of sexuality can be presented. That it should include, you know, a wide range of gender identities. Facebook, for example, I think has 50 gender identities. 
And so, which is, which is a moral you know, question. Do we, do we recognize, say, someone who's transgender as a acceptable, legitimate <laughs> orientation in our sex ed classes, or do we regard them as somehow defective, confused, wrong? Do we look at homosexuality or transsexuality, et cetera, as acceptable options or morally wrong? And people get into some pretty wicked fights about this. And that'd be just one example of where the moral education is a matter of great controversy. And not just a matter of, you know, intellectual, academic debate about is it virtue theory or, you know, deontology, but disputes at that level. What should we be teaching the kids in sex ed classes, for example? Now, once we decide on the content, once we've solved all that, then there's the question of methodology. How do we teach people morality? There's been various options laid out over the years. One example, of course, I mean, there's the sort of practical nuts and bolts of teaching. You know, like, should you use like a lecture? Should you use a lecture maybe augmented with YouTube videos? Or should you, you know, use, should you like flip the classroom as they're saying now? And those would all be more about education as opposed to moral education methods. The ones that are specifically about moral education include things like this. Does talking, you know, either giving lecture, you know, sermonizing, etc., is that an effective means of moral education? Just talking morality at people. Is that effective? Does that work? And this would also include not just like the standard, you know, sermons and lectures, but also things like public service announcements. You know, where they say things like, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. This is your brain on drugs with some bacon and orange juice and toast on the side. Does that work? Is that an effective way to do it? Uh, or similarly, would, you know, sort of also go along with this, would things like the uh, after-school specials. I remember you know, centuries ago when I was a kid, they would always have some moral lesson to them, like brush your teeth or the devil will get you, or uh, <laughs> scary stuff. Or, you know, be nice to other people, you know, don't be a fascist, that type of stuff. And do those sorts of things, you know, is that an effective method? You know, do things like TV shows, movies, etc. can they morally educate? Then there's also um, another one that's popular, or used to be popular, is what's called values clarification, or kind of like values therapy. Or what you try to do is you don't impose a morality on someone, you try to clarify their values. Now, of course, one problem with clarification is, is what if the person is like really awful? You probably don't want them to be like clarified in their, their awfulness. I used to use a Bill Cosby joke at this point, but I'm totally boycotting it, so not using that one. But it was a good joke. I feel bad about that. <laughs> so another option is, we'll see when we talk about Aristotle, is habituation. Basically, a person either sort of habituating themselves or being habituated by others. So, Various approaches to how we bring this about in terms of the method. Talking to people, um, maybe more elaborate means and like videos, etc. Maybe the use of compulsive force to force people to be good. And then of course, you know, some we typically use in the law. I mean, the police were mentioned earlier, we use punishments to try to, you know, is that a way to make people behave better? So lots of questions. And again, if you ask five people, you get 10 different responses <laughs> to these questions. Now, since moral education has been rather critical, people have been addressing this for a long time. Before moving on to our, the two dead guys we look at, our good dead friend Aristotle and our good dead friend Jean-Jacques Rousseau, anything about the stuff so far that needs more stuff? <laughs> Now, our first dead guy is our good friend, Aristotle. The stuff we saw about him before, um, still the same. He is, you know, Greek, uh, student of Plato, teacher of Alexander the Great, um, 
died, and is of course still dead today. But on Halloween, like all dead philosophers, he will walk the earth once again. <laughs> That's a lie. Or is it? We'll find out on Halloween. Now, when in regards to human nature, and Aristotle, you know, he answers all the questions that included the question section, mostly for the reason that I just drew all the questions out of Aristotle's answers to them. So, totally cheating you. The first thing he addresses is the question of human nature. What are, you know, people like by nature? Now, our good dead friend Confucius, who is also a virtue theorist, and is also very dead, took the view that humans are basically good. Aristotle, though, doesn't think that people are basically good or basically evil. So what does he think? Well, his view is this. He thinks that people are basically neutral. That they can become either good <laughs> or bad depending on how they're you know, habituated, how they're educated. So, his full answer is basically moral virtues are, we're not naturally good, not naturally bad, but it is natural to become virtuous. Or presumably it's also natural to become non-virtuous. And our development of these virtues is due to habituation. So answer the question, are people naturally good or naturally bad? His answer is, we're naturally neutral. We can, our alignment can go either way. We can go full on evil or full on good. Or maybe this stays kind of neutral. Now, then he turns to the question of, so how do we get these virtues? How are they acquired? Because again, in the you know, previous thing we looked at, the motivation to be good for Aristotle is being good, he claims, will make you happy, which could be a total lie. Now, he draws a comparison between our natural faculties and virtues. And by natural faculties, he means our you know, abilities like, well, to use some obvious ones, like sight, hearing, um, you know, taste, the senses. And we get those before we use them, as opposed to developing them through, you know, we can get better at it, you know, like with eyesight, we get better at recognizing things. But we start off with vision, and these are not, you know, we have them before we <coughs> use them, so to speak. Now, what about virtues? Well, Again, going with the comparison, the idea is, you know, when we're born, assuming everything, you know, worked properly in terms of genetics and development and so forth, you know, we got those senses. So you got the eyes, got the nose, the ears, etc. And so we just use them. You got them, you use them. And of course, we can learn stuff like how to recognize, like, the notes in a song or distinguish, you know, between the flavors. But we have those abilities, you know, built in. So everything went right genetically and developmentally, we got them. Now, with the virtues, though, it's essentially we're starting off, you know, to use like a crappy illustration, they're kind of starting off at zero. We don't have the virtues. We may have certain inclinations one way or another, like I mean, people are more inclined to be brave or more inclined to be generous. But the idea is we generally don't got them. So what we have to do is we have to require them like an analogy to a learning you know, crafts. So we start off with not having them, and we've got to get them. Now, Aristotle, and we'll see this when we get to the, the end of the Aristotle stuff here, he thinks that the moral educator, you know, kind of spoiler alert here, should be taught by the state. And he claims that and this is uh, in addition to the question about who should be a moral educator, it also ties into the rather important question of what should the state be doing? Now, we got an election coming up in 2016 where we get to pick uh, between the Republican candidate. I'm guessing, I used to, I'm guessing it was going to be Jeb, but it could be, um, could be the Donald or the Ben or some other guy or gal. And then, of course, on the Democratic side, I'm guessing maybe... Maybe Hillary. Maybe Vin Diesel. He might go for it. Who knows? So we'll be we voting for which Republican or which Democrat takes over for the next four years. 
And one thing that separates or differentiates the party is their rhetoric about what the state should be doing. You know, one extreme for conservatives, the view is the state should not be doing a whole lot. You know, the small state. And the stereotype for, you know, people on the left is the state should be doing more stuff. Now, that's a very important, you know, question both in politics and ethics. What should the state be doing? What's its role? What's it obligated to do? And depending on how you answer the question, that kind of determines where you fall on that political spectrum. Because if you were for the state, you know, doing positive stuff for the citizens quite a bit, that would tend to lean you to the left. If you think the state should be smaller, that leans you to the right. But weirdly, if you go, <coughs> excuse me, breathing in all those pixels, <coughs> bad for me, <coughs> terrible stuff. Look at that pixelitis. If you go too far to the right, you end up in, instead of having a very small state, you end up in a very big state called fascism. And we'll see that with our dead enemy, Benito Mussolini. Now, if you go super far to the left, you can end up being like an anarchist, which is no state. So you end up with this kind of weird thing, but that's politics, generally weird. So one of the key questions is, so what should the state be doing? Aristotle's view is, the state should be morally educating us, not just in the sense of, you know, having classes that teach us math and so on, but by making us good. Now, he draws an analogy here to, in terms of how we acquire them. So one answer is this. Who's going to do, oh, go back to our questions. What's human nature? Answer, neutral. How do we get, you know, who's going to do the educating? The state is supposed to be doing it. How do we get these exciting and useful virtues? Well, one way is the state's going to impose this on us, and as we'll see later, punish the hell out of us if we fail to do so. At least the state's supposed to do that. And he draws an analogy between learning crafts and learning virtues. And here's how it goes. When someone is born, let's say even like Jimi Hendrix, for example, are they born, say, able to play guitar? No. I mean, people may have certain, you know, propensities. If someone has a good ear, as they say, or good manual dexterity, maybe better a guitar than other people, but no one is born a guitar player. Similarly, no one is born an architect, not even Frank Lloyd Wright. You have to learn that stuff. And so just like with crafts, the way we become, say, a guitar player, or an artist, or a politician or a lawyer, is we start off basically with zeros in those skills. Your skill level, nothing. But the way we learn, the way we play guitar, become a guitar player is how? Practice. Hey, practice. It's like the old joke, how do, you get, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. And so we acquire them by doing. And Aristotle likes analogies, as all true philosophers do, by analogy. We acquire the virtues the same way we acquire crafts. We develop those skills. So just as you become a better guitar player by playing guitar, or a better artist by doing the art and stuff, or a better worder by wording the words, you become a better person at being courageous, or generous, or kind, by being brave, by being generous, by being kind. So in terms of the methodology, he says we learn them as we learn crafts. And next time, we'll proceed to the next exciting slide, looking at the general rules. So have a good uh, Wednesday, at least what's left of it, and we shall meet again on the Friday to do more ethics.